I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and to the elders both past, present and future. We'll be here all together. All right. Well, to introduce Morag, for those of you who may not know, uh, Morag has over two decades worth of experience <coughs> with permaculture, research and sharing this worldwide as well as locally. So not just with communities like ours, but also overseas, I believe we've been involved in founding curriculum for Indonesian schools, lecturing at Griffith University and the Sunshine University, and then all everything to little groups up in the <coughs> permaculture village of Crystal Waters and then coming out to communities like this. So it's wonderful to have you. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that more I just have online, just paraphrase a bit, uh, by relocalizing our food systems, we generate a great many positive changes in society, including a reconnection to our land, community and ourselves. And here we all are. That's proof, so thank you. Please make more egg welcome. And thank you all for being here. This is the first of a series of new programs that um, I've been talking with the council about running for a while now, which is um, the Masterclass series. So I'm, I can see a few familiar faces um, in the audience, people who've been to workshops I've done before. And I kind of got to a point, I think, with a lot of workshops where people come to just about everyone and they were asking for some more. So I said, let's run some masterclasses. So this is the first of that. And, and just as a show of hands, how many of you have you actually been to a workshop that I've done before? A few, great. Okay, so those of you who haven't, I'm, I will also um, introduce some of them for the major concepts that, that we're talking about, how to set up an edible landscape, what are the key things. So I'm going to start um, with a, a quick presentation just to give you a few visual cues and a few key tips and I'll, I will through that I'll talk about all these plants that I ripped out of my garden this morning on my way out um, and talk also about um, soil because that's the foundation of all and then when the shade creeps over a little bit into the, the, the community garden at the back we've got a space set up out there where we can actually go out and do some hands-on so the plants that I have here we're going to look at um, how to, to propagate those and you can actually take away with you many of them because I'm, hopefully I've brought enough to share around with, with most of you but there's also some cuttings we can take from the garden. So I was just talking to Lucy before about this community garden. How many of you are involved in the community garden here at Holland Park Library? Is anyone? No. It's a fantastic thing that councils are doing. I think it's actually integrating libraries with community gardens and I don't know if you noticed there's a tray of herbs that you can take. Mm -hmm. you know, not only can you use those as culinary herbs, they're also things you can take and put into your garden and grow as well. So you know, this, this is a great resource. And also, if you'd like to get involved in the community garden, there's a couple of different ways. One is when you come to borrow, <coughs> excuse me, you can just wander out there, take a few snippings, take them home, take a few herbs for your dinner or for your lunch or for your garden. That's totally okay, you know, respectfully, of course, and I'm sure you, you all would. Um, the other thing is actually um, getting involved in being a gardener here. And I think Lucy was saying to come and speak to the librarians and express your interest and they'll tell you when and where and how you can do that. 10th of March is the next meeting on a Saturday morning for sure. Okay. Yeah, so we'll have a bit of a look around what's actually growing there so you know what's there that you can eat and, and how you might be able to use some of those things. And we've got some tables set up and we'll be able to do some propagation from the garden and from the plants that I've brought today um, and explore some, some design considerations. We'll look at how you might set up your own garden and, and talk about that. So lots of things to, to do in this session. We'll have a break in the middle too. You can have a cup of tea. And if you get too hot out there, we may be able to come back in and sort of finalise in here as well. But hopefully we'll have some nice shade out there, which would be good. How many of you are gardeners, by the way, just to give me a bit of a... Well, wow, everyone, right. <laughs> That's wonderful. Now, what I always say too is one of the biggest things, one of the best ways that I've always learned about gardening is by sharing with other people. And, you know, um, Kylie, who's sitting back there in the green dress, hi Kylie, <laughs> she was down um, helping to get North East Street City Farm um, started in the early days when I was there too. And one of the best things I think about being involved down there was kneeling down the garden with other people 
talking about plants, about soils, about design, different people from different cultures, different backgrounds, and that was kind of permaculture university for me. It was a place to actually share and learn. So, um, yeah, don't be afraid to kind of stick up your hand or just call out different ways that you do stuff as well because it's we all have a piece of the picture. I think part of what the, what's happened is that a lot of the knowledge about growing and eating and harvesting and processing has been lost in the last 50 years. You know, we've all focused on, you know, getting our food from, from the stores and, and that happened, you know, it was part of the process of development of society but we, we really do, we have lost so many of the seeds, so many of the plants, so much of the knowledge and it is about collectively sharing that to, to be able to, to spread it out again. I had the great um, privilege of walking um, around my property the other day with a, an Aboriginal elder and we, he's going to come over to my place a few times and I filmed it. So if you want to actually have a look at some of the conversations we had, you can go online. I'll give you all the details soon. And we walked through the landscape and he was saying, this is your supermarket. You know, look, you've got nuts, you've got fruits, you've got medicines, you've got herbs. And he was talking all about the, the roots, the shoots, the weeds and everything, how you could use every single piece. It was absolutely fascinating. And every day I learned something new about something to do with plants. For example, a simple thing like, you know, pumpkin. I, I just, I'm in love with this plant because it's one of those so, such easy plants to grow. Who's grown pumpkin before? Yeah. It's kind of easy, isn't it? Although it does it by itself. I actually don't think I've planted a pumpkin for the last 20 years, maybe. Maybe 10 years, or maybe I'm exaggerating. But it just keeps growing in my garden year after year after year. And it comes back. Now, the thing is that, um, Sometimes people think, oh, it takes up too much space, it sprawls over everything, it climbs over everything, and you know, you have to wait for ages to get the pumpkin, and sometimes they fall off and you don't get anything. <coughs> You're actually walking past one of the, the best food sources without even noticing it. It wasn't um, until I went to Korea many years ago that I realised that this bit is one of the best parts of the pumpkin. Now, has anyone else ever eaten the leaves of pumpkin? No. Yeah, yeah. It's one of my main leafy greens in, in my garden. And it's there pretty much all the time. It's amazing. And so if you need to sort of trim off a bit that's heading off down the garden somewhere, there's dinner or lunch. You know, it's not, it's not a problem, it's a solution. Or, or I even just go along and I just take off the whole end like this. And that goes in the soup or the stir fry. Or it's, not, it's not the salad because it's got like the little tiny little prickles on it. The young ones are... I'm not going to get the big old crusty ones. That's that's a different thing. But the pump, the young shoots, the flowers, but not the not the female flowers. Now, who knows the difference between a female flower and a male flower? Yeah. Yeah. So, what is it? Um, the male flower has got a long stalk and just one little thing inside. Yeah. And the female one's got a bit of a bowl and it's got yeah. like four little catalyst thingies inside. Yeah. So it, it comes it's up close to the stem. stem. Yeah. And it, the, the, one of the easiest things without even opening it up is actually this bit yeah. it has like the little baby you know you think of pregnant pregnant females it's the pregnant you know it's waiting <laughs> ready and if it gets pollinated it will turn into a big pumpkin if it doesn't get pollinated it will fall, fall off, off. Mm -hmm. but so if you're wanting to eat flowers don't eat these ones because that's where you're going to get your fruit from obviously isn't it so you know eat these ones mm -hmm. and that way you can eat the flowers you can eat the leaves, you can eat the shoots. Now also, the pumpkin skin. I used to throw away pumpkin skin. Who eats pumpkin skin? Beautiful, yeah. But like when you're doing roast pumpkin. But what about if you're doing pumpkin soup? What do you do with the pumpkin? Do you chuck it, chuck it in? Yeah, great. I grew up in this household. Like My dad um, was always the pumpkin soup maker. And he would beautifully take off all the peel, put in the compost and you know, so that's what I saw and that's what I learnt and that's what I did. And then one day I went to a friend's house and she just kind of got this big knife and chop, 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 chop. And what are you making? Oh, soup, really? <laughs> and it was a great surprise to me because she just put everything, seeds, skin, the whole lot. And it, you know, it's all part, it's all part of the nutrients and the proteins and the, you know, the, the green bit is really valuable vitamins and nutrients. So. So the one thing is, we, we tend to wait for the orange flesh, thinking, well, that's what we're actually looking for in a pumpkin. Not seeing all the rest of the food that's there. The skin, the seeds, the leaves, the shoots, the flowers. And if you look at every single plant in your garden, so I use, I use the pumpkin 
as a kind of an example, because we're all familiar with this, and it's sort of, so I ask people to kind of think like a pumpkin when they're in their garden. And what are, what are all the other ways that you can use all the other plants in your garden? Or think about how you can plant particular type of plants. That means that all of the parts are edible. Um, for example, another example. Um, who knows what this is a cutting off? Sorry, I have to turn the lights on again. <laughs> no, it's not a bay. No, it's not a bay, but it is a, it's a tree, obviously, or a small tree, shrubby type of fruit tree. It's not a guava. No, it's a pomegranate. Oh, no. okay. Now, who knew that the leaves of pomegranates were edible? No. When you cook them up. They're not so great raw, but if you cook them up, they're also excellent. So, you know, um, who's made olive tree tea? Who ever drunk olive tree extract? You know, you buy in the shops. Well, if you need olive tree extract and you have an olive tree, instead of going and buying the extract from the shop, you can actually just make up a rich brew of olive leaf tea same thing, maybe just not so quite as concentrated, so you might have a few cups of it instead of a teaspoon. And so there's all these things in the garden all the time, all different parts, because I start looking at things, for example, my olive tree very rarely actually gets olives on it. So I look at it and I think, hmm, hello olive, what else, <laughs> what else do you have? It's that, that sort of the questioning mind of thinking about how you can use different things in different ways. And I was looking at, what was I looking at the other day? Oh, this little one. Who knows what this is? Yeah. Did you know that these young leaves are cooked up as a delicacy in many parts of Southeast Asia? I didn't know that until recently. You know, I was looking at my mango, which happened to be, it was a beautiful dwarf mango that got frosted. And so all I had was the rootstock left. And I have never had any fruit on it. And I was looking at it, you've got to go. And then I looked at all these luscious leaves, I thought, but you've got to be good for something. I don't really want to chop you out. So I went and I researched, and lo and behold, not only is it edible, it has so many medicinal properties too. There's so many things for, for diabetes, for um, respiratory issues, all different sorts of things. So I started looking into it and just went, wow, there is so much about plants that we don't know. When we kind of come at it, at it from just this one dimensional thing, mango, we're looking at the fruit. Pumpkin, we're looking at the pumpkin flesh. Beetroot, we're looking at the beetroot, whereas actually the beetroot leaves are far more nutritious. Carrots, you can eat the tops. Sweet potato leaves are more nutritious than the sweet potatoes themselves. So all those different things. And so really, what I try and encourage people to do is to think about, um, think about all the different plants differently and ask the question, what, what are the other ways that I can use it? And it could be, it could be that they're good for mulch as well. Um, and so it gives you that opportunity to really expand the possibilities and possibly even 10 times the amount of food that you get out of your garden simply by changing the way you think. And I think that's an amazing way to, to think about gardening. So I've got, got up here sort of 10, my 10 key tips for a thriving edible garden. I just want to run through them because I really think that they, they help. Now I'll see if I can work this technology. There we go. So the first thing is... Um, to diversify. Now, in your mind, when you're thinking about, if someone says, yeah, I've got a vegetable garden, what comes to mind? What's your visual image? Cabbages, just rows. Carrots, cabbages, like rows, in, um, in maybe possibly raised beds, something like that. Yeah, this is my vegetable garden. You know, it's just a diverse, system of flowers and herbs and lettuces and fruits and bush tucker and natives and um, it's, it's its own ecological system. And I've developed it over time, just keeping on filling in the niches. And what it does is it means that it's actually a self-mulching system and it has so much diversity that it, you know the pollination happens and it's also, I don't use any pest management of any kind because all of the, it attracts beneficial insects which then predate on other things. It has little hidey hole spots where little <coughs> birds can hide and then they come in and they watch and they peck off the bugs. So each, t each year more and more diversity and, and a more robust and resilience comes into that system. Um, so um, it's, it's an amazing thing. I was just talking to, who was I talking to before about, yes I was talking to you, when 
you know, it's really hard if you don't if you don't water for a day, everything just kind of flops. Mm -hmm. What if you could create an edible garden, maybe an edible landscape, that meant that if you didn't water for a day, a week, a month, there would still be food. You could go away and come back, and there would be food in there. And that is the kind of garden, the edible garden, the diverse edible garden that has perennials and polycultural things that maybe your hedge, instead of being a, um, a sort of a non-edible one, could be an edible one and has edible leaves on it. Maybe, you know, so it's actually flipping our concept of what is an edible landscape or a vegetable garden into something that is a, a robust and resilient um, system. Now, sometimes, like for example, uh, this is a, quite a few years ago now, but in between these trees, um, when it's, when it's really hot, you know what happens to lettuces, they just kind of fall over and quite often people build little covers over the top. What I do is I make a little space in between some of the little fruit trees and I stick my lettuces and my salad greens under there because there's the natural shade. And then in winter when there's not enough light, they, they creep out and I plant some more out there. So that they kind of move from time to time, season to season, to different places. But mostly the structure is, is a perennial garden, there's food there all the time. And the annuals find their place in amongst that when there's an opening, a light opening. And so it's really, the first thing is actually about observation, I suppose, of, of understanding your garden. And as, as also part of that, observation, once you've got observation and know kind of how things are working, to really focus on building a soil life. Because the more life there is in the soil, the more you'll be able to grow an abundance of food. Now the thing is that if your soil isn't alive, it's the plants are completely dependent upon you because you have to feed it, you have to water, you have to do all those things. You bring in the mulch, bring in the <coughs> fertilizer, maybe do some pollination, all those things. So the more alive the soil is, the more it feeds the plants. Healthy plants are less, are less um, prone to pests and all those things. So. Um, actually really making sure that everything is completely and fully mulched because what happens when the sun starts to bake the top layer of the soil it, get, it becomes dead and no life can live in that dry crumbly soil so what you want is so much mulch on there really that underneath that layer of mulch it's crumbly and moist and cool it's like a really thick layer and actually that layer of um, mulch is feeding the soil too this idea if you go into a forest um, you think about how things work in a forest. How does a forest feed itself? Where do the trees in a forest get their food from? The leaves, the leaves are dropped. Yeah, yeah. And how do the leaves that drop get to the roots? So there's a fungi. What? Other insects. Yeah, yeah. So things come up. And that, I don't know if you've ever walked through a forest and you see sort of leaves half twisted going down a, a chute. You know, someone's from below has come up and grabbing it and taking it down into the soil. So all these things. There's more light underneath the layer of the, the top layer of the, the surface of the soil than there is above it completely. There's this thriving life going on under there. So we need to to feed that life. And top feeding is actually the most natural way. We have this concept that to get good soil, we have to dig it and do this and do that to it. Actually. Top dressing is probably the most natural way because then it means that all that soil life can sort out its own or household order, find its own way up, feed on the things that you're dropping on top, or from the plants that you've planted that are just dropping their leaves. Chopping and dropping a lot is a really fantastic thing. So, um, and then trying to find as many different ways that you can get absolutely <coughs> everything that's in your household to go into the soil that's biodegradable. So what are all the things that you could possibly put into your compost worm farm system? Shredded paper. Shredded paper. Cardboard. Cardboard, Cardboard veggie Hair. scraps. Hair. Hair? Absolutely. What else? Vacuum cleaner dust. Vacuum cleaner dust, <laughs> yes. If you've got, you know, you'd want to make sure that you've maybe got natural fibre uh, carpets mm. and all that sort of stuff, otherwise you'd have mm. plastic. <laughs> Fibers going in. This is actually a huge issue. The more we surround ourselves with plastic fiber clothing, plastic fiber carpets, plastic fiber every curtains, that all drops down. And where does it end up? Either in our soil or in our oceans. 
and there actually is no way for plastic. Every single piece of plastic that has ever been made is still on this planet. And it may just be in a smaller fibre somewhere or in the gut of a fish in a deep ocean somewhere, but it's still here. So I guess the thing to think about is that if, if I want every single bit of biodegradable material from my household to go back into the soil around me, I need to think about what I'm bringing into my house even as much as the clothes that I put on my back, that once this skirt is finished, you know, it's, I've patched it up as much as I can and I've, you know, taken the pattern off it for the next skirt that I'm going to make, then it goes into the compost or it's a bit of mulch. And so this idea of trying to work towards that zero waste and everything going back into the soil, and, you know, even things like sorbents and so on. And um, my, my daughter and I did this great big... Um, it's called Plastic Free July. Has anyone heard of that campaign? Mm -hmm. Yeah, look up for July this, this year. You can do it any time. But it's this kind of a, a challenge to see how you can get rid of plastics in your life. And we, we went and did it for this. We consistently did it for this whole month. And we thought we were relatively ecological consumers. Consumers and, and um, there were still heaps of stuff. We look at the bin and think, my gosh, how do we collect that much plastic stuff? And so we... We, we went to the shop, to our list of shopping, and we went, oh, no, that's wrapped in plastic, that one's non-biodegradable, that's... So we came out with just about nothing. <laughs> and, then, and so, you know, you think about it, everything from shampoos to conditioners and, and even the, the, the paper wipe things. So even if biodegradable, it still comes wrapped in plastic. And you think, hmm, how about we just go cloth napkins? You know, who still uses cloth napkins? Yay, great. What about handkerchiefs? Yes. Yeah. You know, some people go, <laughs> but you know, I grew up with hankies. I always had a hanky in my pocket. My mum would never let me go out of the house without a hanky in my pocket. You know, who's, who's got a hanky? Well done. I've got a hanky. Hankies are, hankies are awesome. You know, but you know how hard it is to buy a nice hanky that doesn't scratch your nose off? And I just don't think people value hankies. So I'm on the search for sort of good source of hankies, but they're not just any source of hankies. You know, maybe, maybe think about organic hankies that are, so, you know, and then even things like, um, oh gosh, what do you um, what do you wash your dishes with? Uh, all those sponges and scourers that are all full of plastic. What about a loofah? You know, you can grow a loofah really easily here in, in Queensland, particularly you know Brisbane. <coughs> Plant a seed, and you will have a lifetime supply of loofahs from pretty much one season. It's kind of amazing how productive they are. You can use the loofahs for. Um, you know, scrubbing the bath, scrubbing the bath, <laughs> dishwashing, and then when it's finished, it goes in the compost. And so all these little bits and pieces. Or, um, you know, I use, um, I now use aloe vera as my conditioner. I just grab one of the big leaves, open it up. Uh, when I hop out of the shower, I just go out to the garden, smear the gel straight from the plant, just open it up, <laughs> over it goes, comb it through and leave it in. Um, and then... Um, you know, there's some left on it still that goes over your face, that's your face moisturizer. So there you go. I don't have a plastic bottle of conditioner, I don't have a plastic bottle for that. There's no sponges or sponge wraps. It's really kind of pretty easy once you start going along the along the flow and then you think, okay, so that's the house I'll be going into the soil and all of that is feeding the worms. Now I brought in my part of my family of worms here. I think at home I have maybe 10 worm farms, all wow. different sorts. Now, in here. Oh, these guys are amazing. Who actually has worm, a worm farm at home? Yeah. Do you, is it working all right? Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. This, no? no? <laughs> That's your bot for it. Yeah, so these guys, these, and girls, these are the best way to process your food scraps in an urban area because they live in an enclosed environment. You know, if you have an open compost somewhere, you know, you'll get all different sorts of bugs or neighbours' dogs or whatever coming into it. And sometimes even, you know, I find it hard having those bins as well, although I do, do use those. But these ones in particular, if you can find a shady spot to put them, and so my shady spot for the main bit of the, the um, worms is actually on my veranda right near my front door. Because it doesn't smell if it's managed well. I just keep always put every time I put in some food scraps, in goes some ripped up newspaper or a bit of cotton cloth or something, and the whole thing goes in together. So it doesn't smell, doesn't attract the flies, and it's, and then they create these beautiful, beautiful castings that is.
food for the, my plants. And so I'm constantly taking out handfuls of that and just spreading it around the garden underneath the mulch. So it's this constant feeding of the soil life as well, because this stuff is just so valuable for soil and for um, adding soil structure, but also feeding the, the plants in your, in your vegetable garden. So as a worm farm, you can also create a very simple worm farm out of an old broccoli box. I just picked this up at the, up at the fruit and veg shop the other day for free. Whoops, something inside. You can, you can pay a fair bit of money to get a really nice worm farm, but you can also make one out of this. All you need to do is put some air holes in here and um, so that they can breathe. And you might want to put a bit of fly wire over the side so you don't get little um, flies going in. And then grab oh, the cocoa peats outside. Grab one of those cocoa peat fibre bricks and, and make that all fluffy. Put it inside, put, start putting in some worms in your food scraps. And then you'll get a massive amount of, of um, worm life happening in here. It's amazing. If you want to, you can actually start to build them up. Put another one on top and put holes in the bottom and they can keep climbing up and eating the food. So you can Google this. It's a really simple way of doing it. Um, or I actually do also really like the other ones. If you've got a bit of money to go and buy one of those other worm farms, it's definitely worthwhile because you've got the taps on the bottom and you can get that liquid out, which is just fantastic to be watering pot plants or, or you know salad greens and keeping the, the life up. Now, one of the things that I wanted to mention about soil, and I find it absolutely um, fascinating. When I went to school, the thing that I heard was that plants go down and they have roots and the roots get the moisture and the nutrients. That's kind of what you hear, isn't it? But that's only a very small part of it. What happens is, yes, it does that, but most of the nutrients and the moisture that the plants get is actually from the fungal filaments that connect onto the ends of roots and go even further. So there's this whole internet of the underground going on, which is the, the, the mycelium. It's the whole the fungal network. And what happens, if you break those fungal filaments, you actually break the communication, you break the root extenders. And so how you, how you do that is by chopping your ground too much, maybe um, adding chemicals or fungicides or all those sorts of things. So actually protecting your soil and putting a lot of woody matter, twigs and chops, the chop and drop type of concept, not being too, you know, what's mulch material, and that, that feeds the fungus and particularly things like wood chips as well, like a few of those scattered around, um, so that actually feeds it. Now the other type of worm farm is this one here and I've, I've got one of the tubes outside that I'll show you and so if you if you're limited with space or you're a bit worried that you don't have a spot that's nice and shady for your worm towel I sink in these worm towels so it's about it's a tube that goes into the ground and there's this much underground and so when it's hot the worms just go down and they stay cool in the cool of the earth and at night time when it's cooler they come up the tube feed on all the stuff that you're putting down the tube and then go back down and take all that and it all kind of goes into the soil directly where you want it to. So I have, say this is my garden, these two tables, I would have maybe one worm farm here, I'm um, sorry, one worm tower, another worm tower here. So just little worm towers scattered all along. And you can even put in bags of coffee grinds. So in the city, one of the biggest things that you can find easily is bags of coffee grinds. Just go to any cafe. Each cafe would throw out probably 50 bags a week. And if they go into landfill, that's a massive problem for methane. So, you know, as gardeners, let's grab as much as we can and actually turn it into um, uh, soil food. So nurturing the soil life, feeding, feeding the soil, protecting the soil life, and considering that it's an ecological system rather than just dirt. Soil that's considered as dirt and treated that way just helps plants to stand up and is completely reliant on you to make it happen, which is why you have to keep feeding and keep watering. And if it's a really hot day for a month, everything will die. But if your soil life is thriving, you can walk away and things will continue. You know, if it's, obviously if it's really, really hot day, things are gonna suffer, but they will pop back because they've got that um, resilience underneath. Now, just before I move on from the soil life, I wanted to mention something else. Two other things over here, my little soil section. Now one is something called azolla. 
and those of you who have come to my talks before may have heard me raving on about Azola. Azola is this floating fern. I'll pass it around because that's probably the best way to see it. It, it grows on the top of a pond or even a... You could grow it in a, a nice... You could grow in a broccoli box, actually. I got that out of a broccoli box. If you've got a dam, a pond, a little fish yeah, pond type of thing. Just and so it just, it's actually an ancient fern. It was around the time of the dinosaurs, and probably even before the dinosaurs. And what it does, it, it just floats on the surface of the water, and it sucks nutrients out of the water. So when you scoop it off the top and put it into a pile, it very rapidly turns into compost. Now I'm going to pass this around. This is my Azola compost. It's pretty much nothing else in that except for Azola. And um, I just I just scooped it up, made a big pile of it. And um, that's probably about, I don't know, it's maybe three or four months old now. But within a week, it turned to compost. It's absolutely brilliant. Have any of you heard of the Biosphere Project, which was um, a project in America where they were trying to work out, like, you know, if, if we were to go and live on in Mars or somewhere else, for example, how could we possibly live? What were the life systems? So they built this bubble and everything had to work inside this bubble. The water systems, the food systems, the air recycling, everything. And one of the key things which helped them to, to survive in there for the 12 months was this plant because it helped to process waste, turn it into a material that could very rapidly feed plants. It, it can also be eaten too, so it's a leafy green. Um, and it works because it has a symbiotic relationship with this billions old bacteria. And the two of them work to kind of fix nitrogen. Throughout Southeast Asia, this plant is the one that you see floating in between rice paddies. And before they had chemical agriculture, they're absolutely dependent upon this because it floated. So what, if you have a floating plant, what it does is it actually stops weeds from coming up, so it suppresses weeds. Then when the paddy gets emptied, it drops to the, to the soil, feeds the soil, and if you've got ducks coming through, the duck rice farming system, they would be pucking off all of this, so it's feeding that, and then you can eat the ducks and the duck eggs, and you have duck feathers, and so henceforth, you know, this whole system, instead of just rice and pollution. So... When you think about integrating, as part of the diversity, to so integrate these into your system and then it, it doubles in about seven days. So if you have a pond full of this stuff, you can scoop it out and it will grow back. So it's just your constant source of mulch, compost, that you can keep using. Um, so I'm, sorry. Azola. Azola. I'll, I'll write it up for you. Yeah. So um, the pond below where Kylie was living not that long ago was covered in this. So I would go out with my kids, um, we'd go out and hike, we'd scoop it all up and fill up our trailer and then just load it out and make big piles of it. And that's what's covering all my garden at the moment. It's brilliant. So that's, that's on a bigger scale, but you can do it in a garden scale too with little ponds. Um, in some places, they even, um, I've seen, they have a Zola farms in, in some places just so that you can get a good source of, of organic matter. Okay, so that's Azola, and, um, and you only need a handful of it to actually get uh, something a, a, group, a little pond happening with that, because it does it quite quickly. Now, the other one that I wanted to talk about as a, as a soil improvement or, or a, a way to encourage more things to get, get recycled is Bokashi, and I'll write this up too. Does anyone use Bokashi? What is yeah. it? I'll write it up as well. Yeah. Well, actually, Bakashi, it is, it is actually like a rice husk or a wheat husk that's activated with effective microorganisms and stuck to it with some molasses. So, so that's the sweet smell. Yeah, you can smell that. That's the. So what I do with this? Um, what what generally you see it? It comes with this bag of um, bran stuff, activated bran. And it usually comes with a, a tub with a lid with a tap on the bottom. And unfortunately, that you know, it's about $100 to get that whole set up. So what I've tried to work on is how can you use this stuff without having that $100 plastic bucket? And, and it wasn't until I went to um, China that I realised they just fill up big bucket loads. So they put in some food scraps, sprinkle the cashew on, then fill up some more, and they just keep filling it up. They don't need a tap. And then they let it sit for quite some time, 
And after six months, I tip it all out and, and put it all into the soil, and very rapidly it turns into to humus. Now, the thing that I use it for, particularly in my system, is to stop compost from smelling. So if, you're, if you have a bucket on your bench and you've kept it for a day or two, it starts to go a bit rank, particularly in these hot days, um, it, stops, it stops that smell. You can actually lift the lid and stick your head in and take a big, deep breath, and it would smell sweet because it's kind of been pickled by the effective microorganisms. So they activate when they come in contact with, with the vegetable material. And then when that comes in contact with the soil, it activates the soil organism. So if you have denatured soil, which most people in the cities do tend to have, what it's, it's kind of a bit like, it's a probiotic, it's a bit like yogurt. You know, if you, if you need to activate your, your internal gut organism, you eat, you, you have probiotics or yogurt or something like that. This is like that for the soil. It kind of gets all that microscopic soil life happening that you, you can't see, you don't know whether it's there or not. But you see the difference, you see the impact of it being added. Um, so activating the soil and also stopping the smell and enabling you to put things like dairy, egg and meat into your compost is why bakashi is a really good thing to add. Um, can you that go into the worm farm then? Yes. Oh, good. Yeah. And I even, um, I have a dry composting toilet as well and I often put a little sprinkle <laughs> down that too. You know, it works on anything that's needing to be biodegraded, any sort of material. So, yeah, it's great. Um, and another thing, if you if you have pets, um, there is a pet version, which is it's just a bit stronger. So it has more effective microorganisms, so it breaks it down more strongly and more rapidly. Where can you buy it? Um, well, I get, I get it up in some of my local um, food cop, but I have actually seen it even in you know big hardware stores and gardening stores now. It's become more available. Yeah, and if, if, if not, if you can't find it there, which I'm sure you can, um, online as well. It's really, so if you just Google Bakashi. Yeah. Fire at Mount Gravatt. Fire at Mount Gravatt. There, there's a Bakashi Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So there's the one, there's lids that are, um, if you have the lid and you take the juice off the bottom, you can use that as a fertilizer as well. But um, I, when I was, when I had my first child, she's now 11, and I thought, okay, I'm going to do a bit more on my veranda now. Instead of doing big composting, I'll do bakashi, and, and I got it. And, you know, I was focusing on having a new baby, and I forgot to keep emptying the liquid out of that mm -hmm. thing. And I have to tell you that as a new mum, I was getting used to, like, nappies and stuff like that, but the smell of the bakashi in that bin with the liquid that had overflowed was worse than anything. I, you know, and I think I just picked it up and I tossed the bucket to the bottom of my garden and I let the wildlife do it <laughs> until it was clean and empty and the smell had gone and then I brought it back in and thought, right, that's a big lesson. Empty the liquid regularly. But I've since realised that actually you don't actually need to have that. You can just sprinkle the bakashi in any bucket that's got you know, compost receptacle, and then put it into your normal compost, or dig a hole outside and just tip it straight in. Or um, so, unless you're on a balcony and you're really looking to kind of use the liquid for your pot potted plants, I reckon you don't need that special bin with the tap. Unless you're really good at managing things, and I'm not that good. <laughs> And did you say about the dog poo that she could yeah, use yeah. It to break it down? Same yeah, thing? so there are actually, you can get, you, get, you can use any old yeah, bucket or you can make a little hole somewhere in the in your backyard mm -hmm. where you put your dog poo and then um, sprinkle some of this on and a bit of soil, then some, put your dog poo soil, you know. And you can plant edibles. Yeah, yeah, so it actually yeah. turns it into soil food and it activates it in a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, another thing that someone told me once about dog poo, and I don't know if anyone has tried this, is um, using dung beetles. Has anyone tried that? Yeah. They have them that come in the yard. Yeah. So you can actually buy dung beetles and introduce them into your garden system. And the dung beetles take the dog poo and um, 
and and then take it into the soil for you. And how brilliant is that? You know, um, I'm, just, I'm giggling because um, my my kids and I were having um, a bit of a you know that that um, game is it Mancala? Mm. It's where you have the the, the tray and it's got the holes and I had you use pebbles. <laughs> We have lots of kangaroo poo around the house. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we thought, wow, you could kind of take kangaroo, like lack them, and then you could use those as your, your um, main car things. And it could be like something you could, you know, an Australian version of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry, the things you do when <laughs> young boys like to talk about poo. And <laughs> We came up with this idea for um, a game called Scattergrees. You know, there is a game called Scattergrees, right? So you've got to have this thing on your head, and it's a type of poo. What type of poo am I? <laughs> and it was, but it's in a, in a serious thing. It's actually about understanding what sort of animals are in your system and, and where they are and how they, you know, to know and to, to understand that stuff helps you to become more connected to your place, and that's such an important thing. Um, so it, it was kind of a serious, kind of joking sort of thing. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Do you reckon it'd be a go? Would anyone buy scabbies and put poo on their head? <laughs> oh, every ten-year-old boy. Would. Every ten-year-old yeah. boy, would, wouldn't they? That's right. My ten-year-old boy would. Yeah. All right. We've got to slide number two. We're doing well. <laughs> All right. I, I mean, some of these I've already talked about, so I won't linger so long. But um, it, and it relates to what I was just talking about. It's really about trying to create habitat in your garden. So from this, there's a couple of meanings. One is habitat for you. Like, think about your garden as your habitat. And what is a healthy human habitat? You know, it needs some shade, you've got your food, you've got your medicines, you've got your fruits, and all those things that it creates. A, it's a beautiful outdoor room that is a wonderful habitat that nurtures you and provides the things that you need. And that's that shift of thinking from it just being a vegetable garden to being a, a whole system. And the other thing is about actually recognising that we are only one of the species that exist in this landscape. And how can we regenerate the land and enable the land to support all the different species that belong here? And so that means also incorporating native plants, plants that attract bees and beneficial insects, um, ensuring that you have sources of water all around your landscape. And, and if you think from a functional perspective too, and you think, like, what are some of the things in a garden that eat pests? So who are your helpers? Who are they? Blue tongue lizards. Blue tongue lizards, yeah. And, and lots of other lizards. Lots of lizards. Yeah. Um, what else? Yeah. Chickens, yeah. Birds. Birds, yeah. Lady beetles, what was that? Yep. Yeah. So what, what, for example, is a good habitat for a blue tongue lizard? Is it kind of like a clean garden with some lawn and then just a very neat veggie patch? Will you get blue tongue lizards? No, of course not. Um, will you get lots of lady beetles coming in if it's just the functional landscape, or do you need? Yeah, so you kind of get what I'm talking about, don't you? The, the whole point. What's that? I've grown a and they love it. Living underneath. Yeah, right. So it's actually creating these shady spots, these niches, maybe some logs and ponds, and think about what are the type of species that that do live in this environment naturally, and who you'd like to attract into your habitat and providing homes for them. And maybe it is creating little bee walls or um, growing things like this. This is this is what my daughter, when she was four, she called the bee bush because it's always got bees on it. It's just buzzing consistently and there's one outside there. So this is a perennial basil. And unlike the sweet basil, which is always, um, you know, it, it dies back and then it comes, this has always got flowers on it all year round. So it's a shrub that's in your garden that has lots of little hidey holes for those tiny little birds. And I sit there and I watch, as I was saying, little birds come in here and then they dart out and they grab other things and, and then it's covered with bees. You can walk straight past and they won't even notice you because they're so busy on the pollen of this. And it, as well as that, it's, it has, you know, you can use the leaves. I use these to make pesto and I put them in soups and I make medicinal teas. It has so many uses. So it's one of those fabulous multifunctional plants. Um, but also, a really important part of um, the habitat. How do you keep um, you know, animals that you don't want in your garden? Mm-hmm. So that's another really important. So thinking about the protection um, that you need to create. So, for example, it may well be 
Dogs, possums, bush turkeys, bush turkeys. What was that? Wallabies? Did you say this? Wallabies, yeah. What else did you say? Cats, 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 cats. Cats, cats. Well, yeah, so, okay, so say if you've got, if you've got um, dogs, what is, how are you going to manage that? So either you set up a separate area that's dog free, possibly. Um, I know it depends where you are. If you have a tree, if you have a tree garden, then possibly it's you know they can go in underneath, and they're not you know. But if you're wanting to grow little vegetables, maybe maybe that's the bit that you just have fully protected, and the rest is more of a tree, more like a food forest type of environment, which is far easier to manage. Someone was asking me the other day about what do I do about fruit fly. Well, I just simply don't grow foods that get bitten by fruit fly. You know, it's just too hard. You can you can choose to fight it and battle it out and make your garden this confrontational point of, of stress and anxiety, or you can make it this place of peace and calm that you go out to and you choose to grow the things that grow easily. And what, what I've noticed is that once you grow the things that grow easily, you start with the easiest things, and then after that system gets a bit more set up, you grow the next more challenging things or the things that require a bit more pollination or extra bugs and then now I reckon after 10 years I reckon I could put a peach in my garden and I've just ordered one because I have the ecological system set up to actually protect those so it's it's about thinking like accepting too that maybe you know really growing cabbages in this environment is really challenging yeah. mm -hmm. and growing peaches we don't live in Victoria and it's, it's, it's hard because we expect to be able to grow all that stuff. And, you know, we can pick off lots of pests or we can bag things up and protect them and spray them and do all that. Or we can just grow stuff that doesn't get bitten like that. And it's, it's, it's a shift in thinking about what, what, what is food and what we want to eat and what we grow and how we want to in, interact with our garden. Um, next slide. Gosh, number three. Number four. Again, I've, I mentioned about growing multifunctional plants with this, but there's some others that I wanted to mention. And um, this one here, this was one of the first plants. This is the middle one here. This was probably the first, one of the first plants that I put into my permaculture garden um, in absolute abundance. Does anyone grow this one? It's edible canna, Queensland arrowroot. Um, has anyone, those of you who've grown it, has anyone eaten it? The root, yeah. So see this bit here. When this gets a bit bigger, it's just starting now. So when it gets a bit bigger, it's like a big potato. At the moment, you, you can eat this now, but I typically wait for a bit bigger before the shoot gets too big. And it is such a beautiful, soft um, potato alternate you can make. Uh, one of the ways my kids like it, I slice up finely and put it on a hot plate with a little drizzle of olive oil and garlic and just toast it. And they absolutely adore it. You can make um, like a baked potato. You can put it in soups. You can put it in stir fries and curries and all sorts of things. It's it's a potato alternative. And you know it doesn't get the same problems as potatoes get. It can grow all year round in this environment. And particularly, it comes in the summer months when potatoes are not so good up here. So the other thing about it being a multifunctional plant. Look at all this stuff up here. Um, this is a small one. You know, typically. You can get them to go up to the, the roof. Look at all the mulch that's growing on this. All this organic matter. I chop and I drop this thing and, until the cows come home. You know, you just keep chopping it. And you can just lay it down. Or you can chop it up and make it look neat if you like. Or you can run it through a, a chipper. But you've got to have a pretty good one because it's got long fibres through here. A bit like a banana that can wrap their way around mm -hmm. those, those little electric ones. So only if you've got like a really grunty... Um, chipper would you bother trying to do this but you don't need to it's so succulent if you just drop it down very quickly all the insects will go Woo -hoo, and they'll come up and they'll drag this down into the soil and if you have chickens the chickens love it too I chuck it all into the chicken pen because little insects come up to break it down and chickens love insects so then they go crazy on that and they also eat the leafy greens and it's quite succulent so um, another thing you can do in your garden 
one of the problems if you have afternoon sun baking all of your plants and it's you know that's one of the hard things with watering and, and summertime plant a row of this on the western side it grows up as a little a little in garden sun protector and if, if you've got wind same thing um, in my I used it it's extensively as a starter to help me to create because it took a while to get shrubs and bushes and other things up but this grows straight you know I can stick that in the ground now I don't have to do anything else to it and it will take off and, and grow and so it's so one of the things if you're on a slope I planted it along the contour and I kept chopping it and putting the materials sort of uphill so I'm building the soil up behind it and creating little in garden terraces chop it drop it use it as mulch around fruit trees now, there's just so much you can do with this plant, as well as eating it. Yeah. You call it an ed what? edible canna, canna edulis. Okay. Queensland arrowroot is the other name oh, for it. Yeah. Now, it is really the only sort of canna that's edible. Most of the cannas you see around are more for the, the floral thing. And, and you see them on the side of the roads, and you see how hardy they are. It doesn't matter whether it's a rainy season or a dry season, or, a, or whether they're on a polluted road or wherever. They will... They're resilient and robust, which is why they're really great as a pioneer plant. Um, this one gets a little red flower every now and then, which is which is kind of nice, but it's not what you grow it for. I like it because it gives structure and it gives rapid growth and organic matter and food um, directly and quickly. And so if you're trying to get this type of system, that's one of the plants that you really want. Same with, um, same with comfrey. So comfrey grows very rapidly. You take a little section of comfrey, plant in the ground within a week, if you've got a little bit of a shoot on it, within a week you'll have new leaves coming up. And I use comfrey extensively to make my own fertiliser, to collect leaves to put into no-dig gardens. Again, as a mulch, I plant comfrey all around fruit trees to be self-mulching. They've got deep roots that go right down and collect nutrients and bring them up and create their own mulch right around a fruit tree. You just do it around the drip line. So um, with fruit trees, um, so you've got your fruit tree. Now, this bit here what I call the drip line. Now, there's absolutely no point um, doing fertiliser. Can you all see that? Sorry. Just maybe stand up if you can't. But if you try and do um, fertilising or mulching here, it's really not that much point because the main feeder roots are actually here at the, at the drip line. The tree has evolved because over the years, this is where, you know, where the birds sit in there and all, they poo in the tree and then... And then the rain comes and, and it washes off and most of the nutrients fall at the drip line. And so the roots go out to that point. That's where most of the feeder roots will be. So if you're going to feed anything or mulch anything, you're better off doing it in this sort of spot here. This is really smelly. It's a permanent marker. Oh, no. Oh. Anyway, you'll have the example there. For <laughs> People will all know what it is. Just have that smell okay. about it. There. All right, I'll give that back to you. <coughs> That's all right. <laughs> there are other ones. I wish I'd done a better diagram. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so the point is that that drip line is where I put the cumbries. There or just out from that. And so each time when the tree gets bigger as well, you might just want to kind of move your cumbry out a bit. You can have other little species growing in and around that too. Um, but so cumbry is really helpful. Um, and I also grow it along the edges of things too to help just generally grow it, get lots of organic matter going. Can you show me comfrey? I don't have it here. Oh, yeah. Maybe it's outside. It's behind you. Yeah. This is comfrey, yeah. yeah. So basically it's just a low plant which it comes, leaves come out of the middle and uh, sort of a bit spiky feeling too. Um, I, one of the things that I, another name for it is nick bone. And so I, if, if we have bruises or sprains, um, you can even use it on broken bones apparently. Um, you make a, a, a paste out of like a poultice and you just strap it on and keep it, or even an infection, um, we use that a lot. And I make little creams with beeswax and coconut oil and, and that, you know, for bug bites and all sorts of things. So it's a, it's a medicine. Okay, so um, growing multifunctional plants and encouraging self-seeding. So as I've talked about perennial plants being one of the key things to having a really robust and resilient edible landscape. So is self-seeding. So I mentioned the, the um, pumpkins, but there's many other things. Like I, 
I also don't remember the last time I planted tomatoes. Now, tomatoes is kind of one of those, it seems like one of those things that as a gardener, you know, if you grow the good tomato and you can show other people you've grown, you taste my tomatoes, won't you? you know, I remember going to my grandfather's house when I was a kid and the first thing you do when you get there, he'd take you out to his tomato plants and mm. it, you know, it's, it's the brag, the gardener's brag, yeah. they're tasting that juicy, and they're completely different, aren't they, from the tomatoes that you get mm -hmm. in the stores. And there's something about them. And you know, it's the same with apples. If you get an apple straight off a tree, or even an apricot, well, most things actually, even a potato straight out of the ground is completely different to a yes. potato that's been sitting on a shelf somewhere. That, but tomato seems to have that thing. But growing tomatoes can be quite a challenge, you know. Mm -hmm. And particularly here, one of the things I find is so easy to grow is the cherry tomatoes. Yes, yes, because yes. they have slightly thicker skin, they don't get buggy and so and they don't get um, you know like the fruit fly and they just come up year after year it's actually the wildest version of tomato so originally they were all sort of like this and then we hybridize them to get bigger and we cross you know cross them and create these hybrid plants and then as when they seed they split back into their component parts and this is the one that's the stronger one so it, you, if you kind of watch what nature is doing and it's showing you the strongest type of tomato that can grow in your environment. And, and this is the one that keeps coming. So I just, if it's in the middle of the path, I either pull it up or I might gently prise it out and move it. But wherever it comes up, I leave it and I create a spot for it to be. And that's where the tomato comes. Another one that um, comes up all the time is things like mustard spinach. Mm. Who's, um, whoever grows that? Yes. Mustard that spinach is one of the most amazing uh, gifts a gardener can have because it comes back year after year. Um, there's the red mustard, the green mustard, the frilly mustard. Now the thing I like about, I started out with these, with, with these perennial plants and things like mustards because they've got a bit of a spicy flavour. You think rocket, um, although the, the deep purple mustard spinach is a little bit more like wasabi and it's, it's fantastic. If you have a, um, you're going to have nori rolls, you know, a little sushi, you can wrap it in with that and you don't actually even have to dip it in the sushi, uh, in the wasabi, because it's got its own. Mustard <laughs> seeds, <laughs> is that guy joy? Is that what? Guy joy. Oh, I don't know. Could be. There's so many names for so many of these sorts of um, plants from different parts of the world. I don't know. I'll look that up. Do you bother staking the tomatoes, for example? Or do you just Mostly them... I don't. Mostly I just allow them to tumble down. Sometimes I like over a terrace wall, or sometimes I might put a, um, I put a, like a, a bamboo teepee trellis and just try and attach them. But I typically find that the more I stake them, the more they get baked by the sun. They look a little bit ragged. They get broken as you're holding them up, and it's kind of like birds. Here's some tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> so if I just let them kind of ramble where they are and tumble where they are and then just go and cross them. I get so much more tomatoes. So it's a bit, a bit of a wilder approach, but I've just found over the years that I actually get more out of it. So the more I leave things, the less I look after them. I mean, there's a sense of order, and order within the chaos, you know, but there is, an, like the, and I find sort of a natural beauty in the, the colour combinations and all that sort of thing, but there's not that sort of orderedness. And I think things find their own space and find their own way, a bit more on that. But So anyway, I just wanted to mention this mustard spinach a bit more because the mustard, when it first comes up, there'll be a whole flush of them in one spot because it, they've dropped all the seeds. So you can just go and grab all those of that salad for ages and you just keep one or two in that spot because they get really big. And so you can take all the young ones, like little microgreens, then when they get bigger, keep harvesting the leaves. One or two in a, in a meal is all you need because they're, they're so huge. And then very, they go to seed very rapidly, so people go, oh, this is a problem because it's, you know, it goes to seed too quickly. But, you know, look at it differently. Once it starts to go to seed, see this stalk here? While it's still wobbly like this, it makes an awesome vegetable. It's like having a spicy asparagus. So you can eat, and see how this looks like a little um, broccoli or something? Yeah. It's the same family. It's edible. Eat it. It's great, just chop it, put it into a soup, a stir fry, whatever it might be, or even a, just lightly steam it and have it on the side of whatever d dish you're having. And then when it goes up further, it starts to flower. All those yellow flowers all through your garden attract amazing insects into your garden. And 
<coughs> they're all edible. So you can go through and grab all these nice little bits of spice to add into your meal. And then when the flowers are finished, you get these little green pods. And those pods, before they go hard, while they're still young, you get rid of those. It's like eating peas. It's got a pea-like flavor. Well, it is actually, you know, a seed pod. And then when they go dry, then you get all the little black seeds, tiny little black seeds, like 